Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. Today, we will extend our discussion of digital humanities in the realms of power and privilege by discussing the feminist and queer aspects of digital humanities. Feminist digital humanities is aimed to identify and explore women's sense of writing as well as to prove seclusion of women's work in most of the digital archives. Feminism, as we know, is an analysis of the ways that power is created and refight by privileging the systematic operations of patriarchy. Feminist DH questions the biases of algorithms and the patriarchal hegemony which exist in computational modeling and machine learning. It is reinforced by gender gap and gender bias in terms of representation and also of creation of technology. As discussed earlier, an intersectional framework to consider a feminist DH necessitates engagement with not only gender but also all other axes of identity including race, class, sexuality as well as the digital divide. Feminist DH implies the intersection of feminism and digital humanities to embrace digital and computational methods in the analysis of power and to identify and explore the widespread presence of women's work in most digital archives. The ideas of feminist DH maintain shared concerns regarding the treatment of gender and the field's enactment of systematic exclusionary structures. According to Amy Earhart, the two major issues facing feminist digital humanities are systematic biases within the infrastructure of DH and the need to decenter the whiteness found in DH theory. Earhart suggests that these two issues are not binaries, rather they are fluid and moving. Feminist DH needs identification of bias in infrastructure and also recognize that DH work has been occurring outside of white masculinist western DH structures. Harvard University's Me Too digital media collection can be cited as an example. It accumulates and preserves the digital footprints of the social media driven Me Too movement and the accompanying legal, political and social struggles in the United States. Elizabeth Losh and Jacqueline Vernimont, well-known media theorists and digital rhetoric scholars, argue for centrality that intersectional feminism must occupy within digital humanities practices. Intersectional lenses transpose identities of race, gender and sexuality and this hermeneutical labor empowers us to witness that overlapping identities are targets of scorn even in the digital milieu and therefore must be historically contextualized. The authors highlight the significance of embodied experience, materiality and labor in shaping knowledge and intersectional representation in digital spaces. They have also cited the example of commodification of the bodies of black women through pornography in digital spheres. Algorithms prioritize industry and markets that are profitable even if it is at the expense of marginalized groups. Conventional normative conversations in DH have shifted and become more inclusive of the marginalized with the development of technological reach. Digital archives are one such forum that provides feminist assessment and recognize the ways in which feminist digital literary studies have impacted the field of DH. They use markup systems to map the priorities and research agendas of their creators and users. Markups are basically systems for annotating or tagging text in a way that adds a structure and context to the content. We will learn more about markup languages in the later modules. The notion and practice of feminist markup 
has evolved out of digitization and encoding of women's writing as well as feminist literary criticism. Wanimon delineates the role of digital archives in making visible women's writing that has historically been marginalized. Feminisms of digital literary archives encompass understanding how feminist theory and digital practices are critical contexts for literary scholarship and to situate women's writing as transformational. And therefore, digital archives are also thresholds between actions. It is in a 2013 essay titled Wins Feminism Assessing Feminist Interventions in Digital Literary Archives that Wani Mont has talked about feminist markup and analysis. She asks whether we can describe digital archives as feminist or are digital archives feminist because the content is by women or because the modes of production are feminist or because the technologies themselves are feminist or used to feminist ends or is it all this? She however concludes that archives whether digital or analog are important in the 21st century. Markup languages like XML and SGML are not neutral but are political tools that must be taken into the techno-social context. The techno-social world in which we live is one wherein our technologies cannot be safely fenced off like they could be in the beginning of the 20th century. In a state, our changing technologies now are embedded in co-evolving social practices, values and institutions. The use of interpretative markup that provides instructions to describe the meaning of content rather than how it should be presented highlights blurring of boundaries in feminist literary criticism by providing digital access to marginalized women's writing and also using it to demonstrate inconsistencies in male definitions of genres of writing. Understanding markup as interpretation opens up a feminist intervention that does not privilege pre-established patriarchal definitions of text. Instead of forcing women's writing into patriarchal or canonical genres, the interpretative nature of markup can be mobilized to create new genres and genre tags to accurately describe women's writing. Unlike most digital archives of women's writing, the 2007 Olento project is not an archive that provides digital editions of existing texts. It is a born digital resource that focuses on gender and other aspects of cultural formation. With more than 200 text sets, Olento project is a digital channel to represent gender, literature and culture in digital born writing. This 2007 project owes its namesake to Virginia Woolf's novel, Olendo, a biography to signify its break from conventional patterns from a feminist point of view. It had been conceived by Susan Brown, Patricia Clements and Isabel Grundy. Olendo's markup is highly interpretative and grounded in feminist scholarship. Each tag set represents the nuances of women's identities, texts and related activities. The creation of texts like the cultural formation exemplify women writers as part of social groups. The markup extends feminist theorist Lucy Irigiri's assertion about the plurality within each individual woman. The use of semantic markup in Olendo project therefore is to observe the priorities of their creators and users and also to map its textual human interpretations into a set of codes. This project also highlights the political and social conditions that have helped to shape writing by women. At this point, it would be interesting to refer to Deb Veruivan's talk, Has Anyone Seen a Woman? 
at the 2015 Digital Humanities Conference held at Australia. It was a response to an all-male plenary panel that opened the conference. It directly pointed out the hidden gender imbalance in the field of digital humanities. It also clearly suggests that the worldwide debate around gender and digital humanities has not only been, but is still is urgent. Imagine for a moment what it's like for the rest of us attending a DH conference. When was the last time the conference air conditioning didn't feel right to you? When was the last time you had to queue to use a toilet? When was the last time you thought twice about what to wear on stage so that you could use the lapel mic? Why are they even called lapel mics? When was the last time you saw seven consecutive women get up at a DH conference and speak about anything other than gender? When? Any takers? No, because it didn't happen. It hasn't happened. You've made a world designed around ensuring your own personal comfort, but it's not comfortable for many, many other people. What do we do? Well, firstly, we can turn the air conditioning down. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm over sitting in the seats freezing. Seriously, seriously, I'm calling it. It's time for you guys to sweat and have a sense of what it's like for us. This is not about issuing another policy advisory for inclusion. This is not about developing a new checklist to mitigate your biases. This is definitely not about inviting a token female up on stage to join you. This actually needs to be about your plans to exit the stage. This is not about learning how to do it better next time. This is about leaving before there's a next time. This is not about approximating equity where 20% or 30% or 40% or even 50% is good enough. This is about letting other people in by letting go of your privileged positions. Do you know how quotas make us feel? They make us feel like we're only here because you have quotas, not because we're great at what we do. The problem isn't how many of us there aren't. The problem is how many of you occupy the positions that get to speak. We aren't the problem, you are. <clears throat> and I want to be really, really clear, even 50% representation or 51% if we want to be statistically accurate going forward isn't even close to equity. Given the number of years that women have existed and continue to exist in this field as a minority, the closest we can get to equity would be for men to leave the stage proportionally for an equivalent number of years. So I want 80% women and 20% blokes for 30 years, and then we'll have equity. <laughs> so in reality, I'm actually not that agitated by that definition of equity. Let's face it, the last 30 years have been pretty horrible for most of us, and I'm not an especially vindictive person. So I wouldn't impose the last 30 years on someone else which is why I ask you to stop imposing it on us now. So here's some practical tips for how you, blokes, can leave DH in a better place than you found it. One, if we're going to get quantitative, let's get quantitative and number your days, and preferably publicly. Two, find someone who doesn't look and sound like you and mentor them and encourage them and invite them into your role. Three, have a clear, purposeful succession plan and enact it. And finally, above all, be more than binary. Do this because you embrace diversity in all its complexity, not because you have checklists or policies, but because you recognise that the real story of DH is more heterogeneous and more complex and more vibrant than you have allowed it to be to date. Feminist digital humanities argue for a rhetoric that allows for a disruptive technology that subverts the patriarchal structures. They want to shape new spaces of interaction for marginalized voices. They want to shape new spaces of interaction for marginalized voices in a restrictive digital sphere. Restrictive 
as it perpetuates the conventional power hierarchies. These submersions allow to reclaim some of their material existence in the digital sphere that comes under attack where the body is not immediately present. Liz Lane has defined feminist rhetoric as any written or spoken act about feminisms within the context of feminist interventions online that allow to reclaim material experiences of feminist voice. Feminist rhetoric enacted online mirrors the feminist body politic that fosters a networked relation between authors, readers, spaces and public. Hashtags are rhetorical interventions that are visually powerful and often serve as a rapid source for reactionary discourses. While the internet has provided a voice and a platform for people who advocate for equality, it has also created more within the movement itself. Digital activism is one of the most prominent feminist rhetorics. Digital activism in the form of contemporary feminist protests reflect the oppressive nature of new liberalism as well as the possibilities for new subjectivities. Let us now look at some case studies of protests that bring out the central concerns in contemporary feminist discourse and body politic as they move towards new social formations. Digital feminist activism departs from conventional modes of doing feminist politics. The emergence of feminist memes has created a renewed consciousness of feminist issues in the public sphere and has mobilized new modes of feminist critique. It enables new kinds of intersectional conversations by engaging with issues of privilege, difference and access. It reminds us of Butler's argument that the body must appear for politics to take place and it can expose realities as it is open to transformation. The feminist protests employ the body to call attention to gender norms and re-signify its identity via modes of hegemonic femininity. We have illustrated these points with the help of two examples which are given on this slide. Feminist Twitter campaigns revisit long-standing debates about male as well as white privilege. We will discuss more in the later modules about feminist political projects that use bodies as powerful sites of resistance in the context of digital feminist interventions in popular culture. The intersection of queer thinking and DH is also a crucial area of study. Queerness resists the logic of heteronormative hegemony, subverting and destabilizing it. It operates as an umbrella term to encompass all non-normative expressions of sexuality or gender. Let us look at some projects in this area. Eve Sedgwick, the well-known feminist critic, has referred to queer as the gaps, dissonances and resonances, lapses and excesses of meaning when one's gender or sexuality cannot be signified monolithically. A queer user interface philosophy or the UI would design interfaces that are political. It foregrounds how conventional UI design limit the ability to critique the operations of heteronormativity, homophobia and transphobia. Queer DH disrupts the reifications of DH itself. It engages in what Sedgwick has called a paranoid and reparative readings by destabilizing the heteronormative narratives. It engages in reparative readings of the omissions and exclusions in digital culture. It dismantles social constructs and subverts expectations on what our technologies might do and finds diverse ways of working alongside them. Queer culture in DH is a speculative project. It envisions a queer futurity in computing and other digital methodologies. Two such speculative works we would talk about are Kara Keeling's Queer OS and Zach Blas' Transcoder. 
They imagine how a queer operating system and programming languages might function together. According to Kara Keeling, queer operating system or queer OS would take socio-cultural phenomena such as race, gender, class, citizenship as well as physical abilities to be mutually constitutive with technology, media and information technology. The logics embedded within the operating system are at odds with the queer OS. This project also aims to transform the material relations among people, environment and technology. The early precedent for queer OS project is Rosanna Stone's The War of Desire and Technology at the close of the mechanical age. She has delineated cyberspace as a techno-social space where interactions can be racially differentiated and gendered or even transformative. Fragmented and complex identities emerge from the prosthetic interaction between humans and machines which form new techno-cultural formations. Stone envisions the everyday world as a cyborg habitat where social systems are constituted through communication technologies. Zig Blas and Mika Cardens are two visual artists who have been interested in constructing diagrams and abstractions for queer technologies and transreal aesthetics. Blas began to develop queer technologies as a product line for queer technological agency that aims towards automating what he terms as perverse possibilities. He correlates with the ideas of Jose Eastman Munoz about a queer futurity where queerness is also a performative because it is not simply a being but a doing for and toward the future. Blas has developed groundbreaking conceptual artworks which are collectively known as queer technologies. They signify that homosexual agency can be embodied in objects by materially constructing its technicality. Blas, who has demonstrated the theoretical functionality of his work at IBM Art plus Technology Center in New York, gendered a gay anti-programming language he named as Transcoder. Transcoder is actually a software developer's kit that is neither finished nor fully developed. It offers a bunch of tools with the understanding that people would add to it and make it their own. However, Transcoder became popular as a queer programming anti-language that reveals a number of limitations of digital computation such as its reliance on linear models of time. It can be said that Transcoder is a queer programming language that provides linguistic possibilities for the queer sociality. Engendering gender changes offers a wide array of gender adapters beyond male and female configurations. A technical manifesto titled as Gay Bombs was also prepared by Zach Blas, which explicates the discourse of queer technologies. QT products engender a utopian performativity that is prescriptive of a futurity and potentiality that insist on the models of minoritarian belonging. These performances emphasize queer time and space that imply the coexistence of multiple times and spaces. Digital archives also become a space to represent transsexual identities. Let us look at the Lily Abbey digital archive documents in this context. They are the queer narratives of Lily Abbey, who, as Einar Wigner, was one of the first people to undergo gender confirmation surgery. The Lily Abbey digital archive is significant not only as a literary object, but also because of its status as a queer text. The life narrative of Lily Abbey called Man into Woman has varying versions. This is compatible with the notion of the trans subject whose gender fluidity marks the narrative as queer as well as its resistance to being pinned down to any single version. The encoded transcriptions of each versions in three languages 
make it suitable for comparative study with the help of a collation viewer. And this suggests the trans subject and the literary object as mutable rather than fixed. Incidentally, the instability of Lily's identity is also mirrored in the instability of the work itself. The German and the Danish version keep the identities of Andreas, which is the fictional name given to Einar Wigner, and Lily as separate, while the English version suggests that Lily is the dominant identity. The versions depict inconsistencies in depicting gender performativity that goes beyond cross-dressing and is linked to corporeity itself. The difference in the identities of Lily in the different versions depict a heteroreality, a world view that women always exist in relation to a man. The digital sphere reflects the social frameworks of our everyday cultural realm. We can also watch the depiction of Lily Elbe's narrative in its movie adaption, The Danish Girl, released in 2015. To conclude this week's discussion on digital humanities, it is important to talk about public digital humanities and the futures of digital humanities. When it comes to DH in the public sphere, the first thing we have to look for are the processes of digitizing old books and documents. Also, what changes occur in how we read and utilize these digitized materials. This encompasses the scholarly practices and methods for digitization, like the existing structures of digital repositories, peer review and citation. So, digital publications can be seen as representations involving conscious selections of specific elements. Publication lies at the heart of academic practice and evaluation and these shifts inevitably impact how scholarship is conducted. Let us look at the existing structures, modes of peer review as well as citation, credit and intellectual property aspects. Repositories like Zenodo provides near unlimited storage for researchers encouraging the submission of data and software to materials associated with conferences, projects or institutions. Each dataset is assigned a stable identifier ensuring long term citability and stability. Digital scholarship can facilitate rapid scholarly validation, potentially challenging the need for formal peer review. Proper attribution and visibility are vital for scholars producing content for digital projects to ensure that credit is appropriately assigned both within projects and also where external content is being used. Striking a balance between open access and the continued role of publishers is a critical consideration for the field of digital humanities. This is occurring at a time when sharing and publishing data and metadata have become increasingly commonplace and in some cases even mandatory. This shift underscores the rapid cultural transformation that has taken place in a short span of time through blogs and less formal publication platforms. The publishing of raw data, code and images that constitute the entirety of the project makes the research transparent and reproducible as possible. The distinction between code and article blurs with the concept of literate programming initially proposed by Donald Knuth and gaining widespread use in recent years. This approach prioritizes explanatory text over code, embedding the letter within the former. Jupyter notebooks are a common form of literate programming. They allow for the inclusion of formatted text alongside lines of code, enabling the creation of fully functional software within the context of a written discussion. However, this raises questions regarding what should be published and also what constitutes research data. The definition of what should be published is becoming increasingly ambiguous as the role of publishing and the notion of finality in research 
are rapidly changing and also continually evolving. Publishing an article in an online-only journal is still sometimes met with skepticism. So, recognizing data or code as valid contributions to digital humanities as deserving of academic recognition is still not fully or wholeheartedly accepted. The advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning will also play a vital role in shaping the future of digital humanities. Let us look at the anticipated impact of artificial intelligence on DH practices, automation and AI ethics. Automation methods have evolved into standardized software packages and websites. This reliance on black box system, if we can use this term, can lead to a lack of awareness regarding the operations being performed on the data. The progression of automating humanities research can be conceptualized in three stages. The initial development of custom-made software, often created by humanist coders, tailored to address specific challenges. The second stage is of the transformation of these early software tools into comprehensive packages like VOIN tools providing a user-friendly interface with minimal to no programming requirements. The third stage is the emergence of more sophisticated machine learning tools designed to customize the machine learning software for specific digital humanities projects such as the Mallet software. The process of automation can also increase the tendency towards formalization made possible by algorithmization. For example, assumptions can be made about gender, race or about the literary canon and create an imposed framework for understanding institutionalized hierarchies. This calls for ethical considerations as well. With the growing capacity to automatically classify extensive data sets, computational tools are increasingly employed to abstract, simplify and visualize the complex big data. Drawing from Malterabian, three key areas for establishing ethical guidelines in AI and DH include the three which are mentioned below. The first is the moral considerations specific to fields of research and their direct relation to the objects of study. It encompasses areas like personal data, attribution and publishing data with potential public consequences. The second is related with the moral aspects of digital humanities as a profession. Governing the conduct of community members and their interactions with society at large. The third area is the ethical responsibility of individual scholars in the scholarly community within digital humanities to the broader society. Encompassing considerations like the environmental impact of technologies and commitments to equality, diversity and inclusion. The future of AI in DH has major ethical considerations. They bring forth considerations of usage, sharing, transparency, respect for others, privacy, inclusivity to the ethics of crowdsourcing, handling controversial or situated knowledge. To conclude our today's discussion, we can say that the intersection of feminist and queer digital humanities marks a transformative juncture in academic discourse by foregrounding inclusivity, diversity and critical perspectives. They not only critique existing power structures but also strive to dismantle them, forging a more equitable and inclusive digital landscape. Additionally, the future of digital humanities through the integration of artificial intelligence in machine learning augment our analytical capacities, presenting both opportunities and challenges in the pursuit of a more just and empathetic digital future. In the next week, we will begin with the concept of digital rhetoric, digital literacy and related frameworks in the context of digital technologies and communication. Thank you.